now people used to wear stethoscopes like this, which was probably quite uncomfortable. And now they're wearing like this. I think that's really weird. I don't know what that's about. I mean, that was quite uncomfortable. I'm sure it maybe presses on carotid bodies and that if you're not careful. But for some reason they did that. Anyway, yeah, this is a stethoscope. It's quite a long one. And one of the interesting things about the stethoscope, and I am going to talk about practical stuff in a minute, is that the length is all about distance from the patient, I think. Before people invented like the tube stethoscopes, which are the first ones, they just used to have like a tube, which they used to listen to the chest with. They used to press their ear directly onto the chest. And then obviously they had the tube, and then they had the flexible stethoscope and distance between the doctor and the patient increased and I just think that's interesting but also I find it a little bit odd because I think personal space between people has actually decreased while well, that's increased and that's a bit weird. Also there's a colour coding thing goes on for example red stethoscopes are cardiology stethoscopes and there are other ones as well uh, but people also they do things like they just want the colours for their eyes or whatever. But here we have the, what is known as the bell of the stethoscope and the diaphragm of the stethoscope. Now, a lot of stethoscopes have this arrangement. A few of them don't have that because they have just the bell. And in fact, in a way, it's unnecessary. One of the things that's really important about stethoscopes, stethoscopes is to make them warm before you touch the patient with them. Because if you don't do that, you're going to give them a bit of a shock. It's about ethics and care, it's not about auscultation but it's a good thing to do. Now the thing about these is you have a clicky thing which turns around and if you look carefully at that, I wonder if I can get that close, you'll see that that goes black because that's then open and then you can hear through the bell and then that which means then you can use the diaphragm. However if you press a bell hard enough and get the skin taut underneath it you'll end up with a diaphragm anyway. The bell is good for listening to higher pitch noises and the diaphragm to lower pitch noises. Now I'm not going to go into huge amounts of detail about auscultation of the heart but I'm going to mention it and mention a few things about what you hear. I also want to mention that this, these need to be tipped towards the external auditory maiati like that because if they're not they will be facing backwards and they won't be facing down your ears because the external auditory maiati move slightly in an anterior direction and you'll just be pointing them the wrong way. Also, don't share them because these carry infection. You can dip them in isopropanol or something and that'll be okay, but really, you don't want that. It's not a good idea. Let's talk about the chest then. I'm not gonna talk about exactly where the heart valves are, where the apex is and all that kind of thing because it's all a bit too much detail to plonk on people in one go. So there you've got, ooh, there you've got your chest. Right, now, that chest, you've got several positions. One position is to lie down on your back in the supine position, and you should also take in that position, and always use the bell and the diaphragm of the stethoscope. And you listen along the costal margins in the intercostal spaces on both sides. The heart obviously is the size of a fist. It goes down to there, down to the xiphus sternum, and it rests on the diaphragm and it's slightly to the left. It's not as far to the left as people think it is. That's a bit of an illusion. When you auscultate, gradually work your way down the costal margins and listen to each one. The apex of the heart will be about there. Um, you'll hear mitral valve regurgitation, all that kind of thing. Uh, you'll see heart, heart murmurs. One thing you'll hear which is a physiological sign, not a pathological sign, but used to be thought as one in Victorian times, is sinus arrhythmia, which is that the heart slows down during inspiration and speeds up during expiration. In Victorian times, they thought that was unhealthy and they used to prescribe bed rest. The real reason it happened was that people were really unfit at that time and so they didn't have sinus arrhythmia. Another thing that happens is when you breathe in, it stretches the blood vessels around your lungs and the, you get splitting and that is a second heart sound. Instead of going like that, it goes like that because it's the stretching of the blood vessels means that it arrives, the pulmonary circulation arrives back in the heart at a different time than the time of the systemic circulation. 
Murmurs can either be systolic or diastolic. That is, they're either between the first and second heart sound or the second and first heart sound. And they are to do with turbulence. Now I want to talk about a few other things you can do with the stethoscope as well as this. Firstly, obviously, you can listen to borborygmus. So you get your digestive sounds. Traditionally, listen to in the lower left quadrant, like that. You're supposed to listen to up to, for up to two minutes. Uh, absent bowel sounds are not a good sign, obviously. So if you don't get gurgling, you've got a problem. If you get tinkling, it means that there is intestinal obstruction, which is obviously a bad thing as well, because the pitch goes up because of the increased timpani. We also have the thyroid bruit. If you listen to someone with an overactive thyroid, what you can sometimes hear is something that sounds a little bit like a murmur when you're listening to their thyroid, which is due to the fact that they have more blood supply going into it. Another one is the mammary souffle, which you found, find in pregnant and lactating people. And that is a sort of vague, I don't know, rustly sound maybe? You will hear sounds like that on the chest. You'll get rustling because of chest hair on males. Um, also, you want to be careful with your knuckles and your fingers because they tend to make crackling noises, which get picked up by the stethoscope as well. There is another souffle which is found in the gravid uterus, which is caused by the placenta. And when you listen to that, you can hear a similar sort of noise. Finally, just below the xiphosternum here, in the right in the hypogastric, hypogastric region, if you listen to that and you get your patient to swallow water, you can time how long the peristalsis takes to get to their stomach. Then you'll hear a splash. If they have an overactive thyroid, it's a fairly good way of judging it because if they have an overactive thyroid, this peristalsis will be faster than average. If they have an underactive thyroid, the peristalsis will be lower than average. So if you time it, you'll be able to work out whether they can or they can't. Now, none of this is supposed to be medical advice. If you don't know what you're doing, go and see a medical practitioner of some kind. And if you like this video, please rate, comment, subscribe, and share. And if you dislike it, please tell me why so I can improve. And I'll see you tomorrow.